if there's anything I'd change, it'd be the experience. But I think the lack of experience has got us where we are now. It's made us, it's forced us to figure it out and bootstrap it. Welcome to In the Thick of It. I'm your host, Scott Hallrow. Not that I don't get excited about every guest and every episode that we launch, but today's is extra special for me for two reasons. First, as a business owner myself, I'm always rooting for other people who have taken the risk to start something on their own. Second, I'm kind of like Oprah in that I love to share things that I love with other people. Maybe one day we'll do a live episode with a live audience and I'll give away all my favorite things, but until then, this will have to do. Today's guest literally feeds my family several times a week. Flurry's Market is located in my town and has quickly become a fixture in our community. I look forward to sharing the story of Clayton Flurry, owner and Instagram sensation behind Flurry's Market in Flower Mound, Texas. Clayton has built a business on delivering an exceptional experience, and he shares what it was like in the early stages of launching his business at the height of a pandemic. From running an oil and gas operation to opening Flurry's Market, we talk about the importance of learning from those who've done it before you, making quality hires, and never being afraid of trying something new. Welcome to In the Thick of It. Well, man, thanks for coming. We're glad to have you here and look forward to hearing your story. Tell me about growing up. Where'd you grow up? Oh, man. You know, actually, my wife, Katie, and I, we grew up in the same town. Now, we didn't know each other growing up. And that town is Shreveport, Louisiana. So just three hours due east of here, driveway to driveway. And so born and raised there and was really able to stay in the state all the way through probably my mid to late 20s, which included military service and college. So it wasn't until 2014 we found our way to Texas. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what was growing up like? Did you go to private school, public school? Did you play sports? Yeah, no, 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 no to all those things. So we didn't really have money, nor did I really have the probably, uh, I don't know, the wherewithal to hang into private school. And so I was what's called a neighborhood kid back in the day. I was went to the, through the public school system over in my hometown. And this isn't a knock. It's just the truth. It's glad I'm glad I survived it. So I went to public school and wasn't really focused on college. Wasn't really college driven. Didn't play sports. I used my size at the time as an excuse, but I was really more interested in just hanging out with my buddies and chasing girls and really did the former the best. <laughs> chasing girls. So you know, didn't really have many aspirations other than I knew I needed to get out of school. And um, that's when I, all of a sudden one day a recruiter, I guess, came to our classroom and said, if you want to get out of class all day, you can come take this ASVAB test. And I didn't even know what that was. Come on, do that. And then I found myself in the military shining boots on a floor and 17 years old, which was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So went into the army as a C student and got out of the army. And that's when I met my wife. Thank God. Chased her to Louisiana Tech. And Did four years there and stayed in Louisiana there after that and found myself in the oil field. Awesome. Are you a big Terry Bradshaw fan? Terry Bradshaw, Carl Malone. Those are the two people say, you know, Louisiana Tech, oh, Terry Bradshaw. I didn't realize Carl Malone was there. Oh, Carl Malone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the duck commander. And I learned, and I think it's true, I think it's true that Terry Bradshaw actually played backup to Phil Robertson. I've, I've heard the same mm-hmm. and Phil just decided he'd rather hunt and fish yep. and yep. didn't want to commit to the game. Mm-hmm. So imagine how different things would be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So college football, really, again, not, not chasing a college or really having the aspirations or being pushed to go to college. I didn't really grow up with an alma mater to root for LSU, Louisiana State University was, is kind of like the state school. And like Texas, you know, you've got so many different large universities. It's, it's LSU or bust, really. Anything outside of that in Louisiana, it's you wouldn't even go to your own home game. You just go down to Louisiana, uh, LSU's home games. But I don't know a single person from Louisiana who doesn't root for LSU, yeah. regardless of whether or not they went there. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the state school, quote unquote. I wonder if there are more LSU fans than Saints fans. Ooh, I don't know. I think if you're one, one a fan of either, you're a fan of both. Okay. Because it's always, especially social media, you see it. It's the kind of the trifecta. You're homeschool. If you're if you go to Louisiana Tech and you win, great. And then if LSU won, extra great. And if the Saints won that weekend, bonus. It's the trifecta. That's mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, there's a lot of people here in Dallas that don't like the Cowboys. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that could go either way. Mm -hmm. So 17 years old, you're finishing up high school and you go straight into the army. What you talked about shining boots, but what kind of jobs did you have in the army? I had many jobs. My stepfather, blue collar, he gave me some wisdom early before I left. He said, get to know the cooks and get to know the supply sergeants. And I had no idea what that meant, but I did heed his advice and it paid dividends because you never went hungry when you had access to food when others didn't in the middle of the night when you really wanted it. And you always had the equipment you needed when you got to know the supply folks. But I didn't know what I was doing, Scott. I just knew that that's where I've wound up. I mean, looking back, it's something I would never change. I mean, I also learned that there's two sides of the military. You've got the enlisted side and the the officer side, if you will, or simply put the educated side. And I was on the enlisted side and I looked around uh, my company and I was one of few of the non-court ordered people that were there. It was a very interesting crowd. Court ordered? Oh man, I mean, people are, I mean, yeah, it's like, hey, juvenile, you can go in the military or you can face this type of punishment. And so it was just, there was a lot of people there that just didn't have any other path to take. And I mean, I guess hindsight, maybe I was one. I could have just stayed in my hometown of Shreveport and I don't know, vocational school or an hourly job or something. I don't know, but it really opened my eyes to kind of long, you know, any career, you, you kind of learn through life what you don't want to do more than what you do want to do sometimes. And so I learned that I sure don't want to be a lifer in this, but I excelled at it. Humbly, I excelled at it. I enjoyed it and got to meet all walks of life. And had I not met my wife while I was serving, I was on the path to go to what they called at the time, green to gold. Maybe it's called that now. And it's uh, where you go from enlisted to an officer status and go to West Point and what have you. And I was going through that process, but I chased my heart with Katie and she was at Louisiana Tech and that's where I, that's where I went. I get that. Mm -hmm. So he said something earlier that really stood out. And I don't know that I've ever met anybody in the military that stayed in the same state Mm. throughout their entire time in in the military. How, how did you- yeah, well, there's a process when you get to boot camp, they say, pick three stations. Where do you want to go? And you look at your choices. And I was just really a homebody. And I said, well, there's Fort Polk, Louisiana. I don't even know where that is, but it's Louisiana behind the, the name. So one, that's choice one. I think choice two, I picked Hawaii just because I was like, man, I could go to Hawaii. Why not? And I don't even know what choice three was. And they said, you can go to Fort Polk, Louisiana. I was like, great. And so it ended up being two hours from my hometown of Shreveport. And so any given weekend, I um, I was not in the field doing something. I'd just get in the car and zip on back home and run around with my running buddies from high school that stuck around. So really my first two years of full active duty service, I got to spend a lot of time back at home. Uh, that's that's a rare, rare yeah. thing. I've got a lot of military in my family and, you know, those six month deployments, they wear on the home front for sure. So that's a huge, huge blessing to be able to be that close. Yeah, for sure. So you did your entire military time at Fort Polk? Yes. That's that was my four year station. That's where I was, but I didn't get that lucky. So, I mean, I literally showed up with papers in hand. I don't know, call it the end of the summer, end of a summer. And They said, well, your unit's not here, so go mow grass. Go get on this. I was like, okay, so, hey, mom, I made it. I'm down here and I'm mowing grass. But, but but what? Well, my unit's over in Bosnia, Herzegovina. And so I'm going to be joining them here in about 30 days or so. And I don't know where Bosnia is, nor does my mom. I don't think she does. So, yeah, I spent seven months in Bosnia right out of boot camp. Uh, wow. Which was interesting. It was uh, towards the end of the initial war over there. And, and what year would that have been? It was 97. Okay. It was 97. Clinton was still in office. And so that was quite the experience. And again, and looking back at it, even today, I was just a young 17, 18 year old kid. I, I mean, you could put me on a plane and say, this is where you're going. And oh, by the way, this is where you're at. Again, I didn't excel in high school in world geography or any of that stuff. And so I, you, I just, I'm taking you for your word. This is where you're at and this is what you're going to be doing. And it was very a simple assignment. I had no idea the gravity of it. Check, setting up checkpoints for war criminals and confiscating weapons and all this stuff. It's like even in the civilian world, a job's a job's a job. You come back and you get all these, all these, oh man, you service. It's just a job at the time. It's just a job. 
It was fun though. I disagree with that, man. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. I appreciate the humility, yeah. but man, it's not just a job. No. I, there is sacrifice and you're putting yourself in harm's way. And some people, you don't know if you're coming home and some people don't. Yeah. So it's well, not just a job. Well, I think, I don't know. I'll speak for myself. I mean, I'm really doing some reflecting as we sit here talking through it. You know, when you're 18 years old and you're sitting over there, I mean, and you don't really come from much from the beginning other than a loving family. What do you have to, I mean, you're not over there going, today it'd be different. I got three kids, a dog, a house, and all this stuff that if I went over there today, I'd I'd be way more timid and go, man, I got a lot to lose. But then when you got the, you're over there just hard charging, man, just let's go. And you're trained. And it's not like I was on the front lines over there. Okay, this is sure. When my brother was still in active duty, we got word. I don't even know how we found out, but uh, he was deployed and one of the hornets in his squadron went down hmm. and we didn't know who it was and waiting for hours and hours and hours to hear back. Like that was hard. Mm-hmm. That was really hard. And thankfully it wasn't him, but there's obviously a, a family on the other side. And the pilot and the Wizzo, the backseat guy, they were both thankfully okay. And they pulled him out of the water and, and I'm sure they had some injuries. But man, that's a long wait when you know something like that's going on. Oh, for sure. And I tell you, it, I don't know if it'd been more of a pleasant experience. This is talking about the deployment. You know, in 97, it's crazy how far we've come with technology. There was no cell phones. Re- I mean, their cell phones were really coming on the scene, but there was no Facebook and apps and all this stuff over there. And so if I ever wanted to call home, it was a major process. I mean, you got to use the phone every third day or so of the week and you had to wait your turn in line and you couldn't just go pick up a telephone and call the 10 digit number. No, you had to call a military post and then give them your phone number. You're trying to call it. You're in a different time zone and it was always echoey. And, you know, it's funny, you know, mom or dad would tell you a joke and You'd hear the joke and you'd start laughing about it, but they're already onto something else. And it was just, it was so choppy and so just inconvenient and good luck. And usually the, the times you got to use the phone is when they were out to eat dinner. So you never got them, right? And you weren't calling their cell phone, you were calling their home phone. So there was, it was just a different time. It's interesting. My wife and I were traveling a few weeks ago. We were in Vancouver and kids were back home. And my wife calls to check on them and she FaceTimes them. And it hit me, we are in another country, Mm. thousands of miles away from home, and we are driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour, and we're having a video call with our kids. Like, that's pretty mind-blowing to think of it, and we take that for granted. We do, we do. And yesterday, finally, I have a brother, I have a few brothers, but uh, the brother, my half-brother with my mom, or we share a mom, he's down in Houston, and it just hit me yesterday afternoon and said, why can't we just FaceTime the two of us together, our mother? And we did. And I said, you know, it's amazing technology. And we leveraged the FaceTime button ourselves yesterday. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. All right. So four years Mm -hmm. in the army. Yep. You met your wife. Yep. How did you two meet? A weekend off, went back to Shreveport and she was, so we're two years apart or a year and a half. And she was graduating high school, but uh, a few months left and, my buddies, again, they weren't really going anywhere fast. And they were still hanging around maybe some high school kids here and there. And so, you know, I found myself at some high school party and uh, she was there. Okay. And, and the rest was history. I think she even had a boyfriend at the time and uh, high school kid. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's where we met. I just come back to Shreveport. And so we hit it off, call it love at first sight, whatever. And so that was two years in the military. And then so I, we stayed together long distance for two years until I got out. Okay. Mm-hmm. And she went straight to law tech. She went straight to law tech and she graduated twice. She graduated uh, with her undergrad and stuck around call it cause I was there or whatever. She, we graduated for my first time yet her second time in 05, 2005. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. When I was getting ready to graduate, I did not know what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that went through my mind was I'm going to get a master's. And for me, it was, can I buy two more years to figure out what I want to do? Anyway, I've always admired people that go that extra yeah. distance. And anyway, good for her. I was ready to move on because at that time, I did feel like I was behind. I spent four years, I leave high school, four years service, now four years undergrad. Now it's eight years. I'm like, 
and some of the friends that I had that they had already graduated. And, you know, I felt like I was behind. I was behind. They'd graduated college. At Correct. This point. Yeah. And so I'm like, and I've, I've seen, and I watched some of them already. They've had their first job for four years in the corporate world. They're owning homes and all this stuff. I'm like, man, I'm still in college, but I'll never forget my father-in-law now saying, you're not behind. You just hang on. And I didn't realize that. So now 9-11's occurred. You know, I got out the year of 9-11. So I got out in June and then of 2001. And so, you know, 9-11, it was kind of a huge favor for military service members because there was this all new renewed respect and we love veterans. And so I kind of got out with, I got out and went to college and kind of was able to compete against guys with their masters and stuff because I had that on my resume as a veteran. And I, my father-in-law was right. I wasn't behind. Yeah. It was interesting. You talk about that renewed respect and I can remember that. Were you ever disrespected? Oh, no, absolutely not. But it was just one of those things that there was just, if you were to check the box of being a veteran, and I say that humbly, I just, it just sure. became true. I mean, when I got out, when I graduated college, entered the workforce, again, I thought I was behind, but I was able to compete against guys that had, that had internships through college and specialized places that, I mean, I could walk in and compete against them just because I did have a little bit, some different training it may not have been tailored to that specific uh, career path, but kind of put me on equal ground. It was interesting. I think there's a lot to be said, too, for the life experience. Mm -hmm. And I did not serve, mm -hmm. but I had the opportunity to intern when I was in college. And that set me up. I had jobs all through high school, all through growing up. I bagged groceries at a grocery store when I was 14 and worked retail jobs and you know all this and that. But I got to intern and just being in that environment, being around other adults, seeing how things work outside of school. And I don't really care what you're doing, military, working in an office, whatever. There's so much growth and so many little things you pick up on just through the osmosis mm -hmm. of, of being around that. Yeah. So I, my method of, of being a C student in high school didn't wash off in the military. I went to school to Louisiana Tech and I, kind of stayed the same way. Now, maybe that's because that's who I am in my DNA, but also I was in a fraternity and there's just so many different distractions and I did maintain a full, almost a full-time job. And so I, my point of sharing that is it goes back to the internships. Obviously the school provided those avenues. I was not aware of them, or maybe I chose not to be aware of them. And it wasn't until getting into the corporate world where the companies I worked for, publicly traded companies, offered internships that, I, and I was able to be a mentor through those programs. I was like, oh, these things existed? I wish I'd have known that. These guys are, they can come in here and work a summer and just realize this isn't for me or not. <laughs> I wish I'd <laughs> Man, and there's so much to be said for figuring out what you don't want to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got to go recruit on the on the like campus of like OU and stuff, and it was eye-opening. I'm like, I didn't know this existed. I got to do some college recruiting at a company I worked for years ago. And man, that was one of the highlights of my job there. Mm -hmm. Definitely wasn't my full-time job, but twice a year we'd go down and we'd make the visits and know, it was just, it was a lot of fun. Some great, there's some, yeah. I don't think the Dean was coming knocking on my door to push me to go to these recruiting events. <laughs> well, what was your major? Business. Okay. And I'm really not sure how I even chose that. I believe I chose it because it was business with a focus on entrepreneurship. And for some reason that just, I don't know, entrepreneur, it attracted me. And also the fraternity had the most prior tests in their tests <laughs> in business. Um, and so I, I don't know, it's just kind of the path I went down. The good old test bank. Uh -huh, the test bank. You know, now that I think most colleges, their exams are online. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if test banks still exist. No, probably not. Yeah. But I'm sure there's something that's equivalent. It's just different. Yeah. There's, you know, the whole bit where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So your business degree, was it a pretty broad general yeah. business degree? You got a couple of accounting classes, a couple of finance, a little bit of management HR. Yeah, I, it was. And so if I had to frame my four years of school, my first two years, if you looked at my transcripts, they, I was failing. It was terrible because I was having to relearn what I really didn't learn in high school because I just didn't pay attention. I was relearning math and history and English, you know, the, and how to study but man, when I got into business processes, not accounting, not accounting, but the things that really mattered, I mean, all of a sudden I became an A student, you know, not economics so much and not finance, but man, the 
engineering management process, you know, anything to do with business plans stuff. Boy, I really loved it. I'd say I almost excelled at it. And so I believe I was, I went down the right path. It was interesting to me. What was your favorite class? I'm trying to think. It was not quantitative analysis for sure, but it was more of just, I think, business planning and business processes. Those really stick out to me. You can't do C before you do B. And how do you do B if you do A wrong? Those, you know, supply chain management, those type of classes. So post-college, where did you find yourself? Enterprise rent a car. Yeah. Okay. One of the people on our team started at Enterprise rent a car. Yeah. And man, I think incredibly highly of that organization. I think that they do such a fantastic job investing and teaching young people. And some people stay. In fact, we've actually got a neighbor who's been with them since he got out of college. And he's probably at least my age. He's probably been out 20 years and been with them the whole time. But everybody I know who has ever worked there, they're top-notch people and they know how to do things right. Yeah. And I fell into that really by osmosis of my father-in-law's neighbor was the regional guy in Shreveport, Louisiana. So I think he managed the region being Shreveport, Bossier, its neighboring city. I got to know him and just, you know, just have some driveway conversations. I'm going to be graduating. Hey, you should check this out. And I just observed his life and go, well, I didn't even know that existed. And renting cars doesn't sound sexy, but he's putting food on his table over there. So I scoped it out and really didn't have anything else lined up. So let's go. And uh, their management training program, it was very intense. But three months of that, I quickly learned it's not what I wanted to do. I, I woke up, I said, I didn't go to school for this. And that's no disrespect to that program or that company. Sure. It's very well ran. But wearing a uh, long sleeve white shirt and a tie in the middle of the summer, washing cars and renting cars you don't have. And just, and it didn't help my friend, some of my buddies that had graduated college a year ahead of me, they kind of found a different path in the energy business and were working half the hours, making twice the money. And just, and I'm a very curious person by nature. And so I kept watching that going, okay, something's not, this is not right. So I was there for a very short three months. And when I left, I was told by that very regional vice president that I was making the biggest mistake of my career by leaving there. Wow. Yeah. Which challenged me to prove him. Well, I didn't have like a, I'm going to prove you wrong. But, right. Well, he was wrong. Does your father-in-law still live? No, that they, I think it's one of those, you grow, you go that ladder and then beyond regional. Now you got to go to wherever and you get moved. Yeah. Well, I'm sure <laughs> there are many people who have gone on to do incredible things that have been told by somebody, this is the biggest mistake yeah. of your life. I was watching, it was like a documentary about the making of Friends, the TV show. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer Aniston was on some other sitcom on NBC that was like, about a pizza place that was run by an alien. It was some weird thing. And the friend's role came up. Somebody came to her and they're like, you'd be perfect for this. And she's like, well, I've already got this same network. I don't know if they're going to let me go. So she auditions. And the friend's people called the other producer and they're like, hey, we want her for this show. And he went and told her, I'm not going to stop you, but you taking that, that'll be the biggest mistake wow. of your life. And look, yeah, right. <laughs> look at what happened. And I don't know. I think for a lot of people, that's that's motivating to prove people wrong. Yeah. And that was the first job I'd ever quit. It wasn't easy. In fact, I gave them a two, uh, I think I did the, oh, you know, here's two weeks notice. And you're like, oh man, I was, you know, we're about to promote you and all this stuff. But that was the first job I'd ever quit. But I sure didn't look back either. You said it was the first job you ever quit. Mm -hmm. You were in the military. Mm -hmm. Did you have jobs in high school? Oh my God. Yeah. So you'd mentioned you'd work in retail. So yeah, I mean- my first car, I had to pay for it. It was a it was a family hand me down on my grandparents' side, and I paid three hundred dollars for it. And if I wanted that thing to go, I had to put gas in it that I paid for. So I was working minimum wage, four dollars and twenty five cents at my buddy's daycare center. His parents owned it, and I was a maintenance man. And so maintenance man in high school, what does that look like? Well, I changed light bulbs and fixed toilet paper holders and cleaned up spills and washed the AC units outside. I mean, waxed the butt school bus, you know, just, yeah. I was blessed to have that job. It was a family business, if you will, that I was able to go to every day after school. And I held that job all the way through high school. And if I wanted Taco Bell, I had to go to work. If I wanted to pay my beeper bill. You had a beeper. I had a beeper. Yes. If, that, if I wanted that beeper to beep, I had to pay that bill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get the 911 text? Oh, and, baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, 
I almost got a beeper and I forget why. I didn't need, what did I need a beeper for in high school? I don't, I mean, but that's how you commute. It is how you communicate it. It's, you would get a page. It's Friday night. You're driving around in that $300 car, friend pages, or you paid your friend and you have to pull over at the 7-Eleven or Circle K and use the payphone. Find a payphone. That's it. Yeah. 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 How far we've come. Yeah. I'm, I'm I hear myself say all that. You'd think I'm like 100, but my kids would say I'm 200. <laughs> I'm 43 years old. So you talked about the maintenance work. Are you a handy person? I can do things. I can change my own oil, rotate my own tires. I can do small electrical things around the house. You know, I can clean up my own pee traps. And I learned through that, through that job. And also my, my stepfather, he was very handy, very handy. He worked for Halliburton, worked on the railroad. And summer jobs with him, I was replacing roofs for family friends. I mean, so I was exposed to a lot of simply call it blue collar work, if you will, which I'm glad, you know, I still mow my own lawn because I get joy out of it. Really. It's not because I have to, it's just, it's that whole adage. No one's going to do it like you do it. Yep. Am I a handyman? No, but I can do things. Yeah. And I'm cheap when it comes to certain things. <laughs> so it's always like, man, I hate paying somebody to do something. I can do it myself. All right. So let's go back to kind of your career progression Enterprise, first job you ever resigned from, where did you go from there? I went to the oil field, as it's called, as a landman. Um, a landman is responsible for everything from running title in a courthouse, property title, to securing contracts from landowners to get the rights to drill or traverse across property, to put pipelines out, uh, settle damages, meaning i you own a hundred acres, they want to drill on it. You know, I need the lease, I need the surface rights, all these things. And so that was what started my career in the energy business was I left enterprise and I found myself in East Texas in courthouses, checking title and checking title means, Hey, there's a piece of land. I find who pays taxes on it. And then I run it backwards. You just run the history, go backwards to find out who owns the mineral rights and every state's different. And so I started doing that. I did that for two years as what's called a field landman. It's called a field landman because you're out in the field. You're in these court, various courthouses. You're all over the place. You're not in the oil field. No. Well, yes and no. I mean, I'm in the county seat of wherever these projects are that are happening. And who are doing the projects? Well, the corporate companies or the operating companies. And that's, I say that kind of, I did that for two years as a field landman. And again, I'm a curious person by nature. And I didn't feel like I figured out the trade or licked the trade by all means, but I kept going, who is sending me out here to do this project? And why are we doing this? Why do I need to go lease this property from Farmer Smith or Susie? And I just kept going back, tying it back to, well, it's because someone, some geologist somewhere, some engineer somewhere has figured out that there's a potential uh, zone of interest that you could produce commercial hydrocarbons. And so I just kept going, well, how do I go to that job? And so after two years of doing the field, I was blessed to, again, in my hometown, found a publicly traded operating company called St. Mary Land and Exploration, been around a hundred years. I was able to get on as a junior landman, now what's called an in-house landman, in-house, outhouse, outhouse for your field guys, where you really, you kind of, you take a step up the ladder and you're really, you're directing field landmen to go do the work that needs to be done. So, and this is a different company than the yes, one. Okay. Yes, correct. And timeline, this is probably 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And East Texas, I remember around that time, the Barnett Shale was a big deal. It it's, just started kicking off. That's and, correct. That yeah. was kind of the mother of the unconventional oil and gas exploration, if you will. So in I North mean, America, that was peak time. It was. I never worked the Barnett play, if you will. I did work with some fellow field landman brethren that had joined our team. We were working something different, more conventional stuff in East Texas that had exposure to the Chesapeake and McClendon and all that stuff that they were doing with the airport, lease in the airport. That was a big deal. It's interesting even today. I mean, I still take notice of driving around the airport and seeing those old, those locations and what been Flower Mound, Denton County, learning about all the fracking and stuff that's going on. And, but being over Shreveport, that was very pro oil and gas over there. I mean, a lot of families made a living from oil and gas. And so we didn't have the people storming the courthouses with the anti fracking and stuff that was happening over here. But yeah, so that's really when I jumped in from being in the field to being in the corporate scene of the, all the unconventional stuff that was taking place. And boy, I wish I had a crystal ball and 
you know, knew what I knew now. Yeah. Well, and maybe this is part of that, but the energy industry, it's boom and bust. Oh yeah, for sure. So, all right. So you go from the field rep Mm -hmm. to in-house. What was that job like? It was amazing. It truly was. I learned so much. I was very nervous going into it. And I was nervous primarily because I I knew I didn't know a lot. I was probably way over my skis, but I had to just say, Clayton, stop. You don't have to know everything. You work for a company that has resources, resources meaning dollars, that you're able to bring in outside talent, lawyers, and other people that have the 20 years experience. Get over it, Clayton, that you're only 23, 24 You've got resources, get surround yourself with smarter people. And that's what I had to quickly learn to do. And I was fortunate to do that. And I got to meet so many people that were in the energy business back in the 80s, went through all the bus and learned from them and how they managed, you know, their personal life through that. And I don't know where I'm going with that other than I just learned a lot. And I learned that I love the business. It was challenging. It was very stressful. Energy projects, initially it was like, we're going to drill this well costs $10 million. That's we're this one. And we're going to do 20 of these this year, $200 million. We're going to spend that. But it got to where it's like, that was nothing. If our region at the time was where the wells were making the most economic sense out of the whole company, we could have a three quarter billion to a billion dollar budget for that year. Just for drilling. Just for drilling. Wow. And, and, and some of that would be an exploration. And you don't know if you're going to hit or hit a dry hole. No, no, you don't. But well, by the time in that business, by the time you have a budget of that size approved, you've spent, again, some pretty material dollars on the exploration side to prove the project. The energy business really goes into exploration, then development. And so I had the, the luxury of doing both, working on both sides of started with exploration is just, just mowing down wells, just staying in front of those rigs, staying in front of them, which is a process it doesn't matter where you're at in the country, which state, what field you're working in. It's all kind of the same thing. You got to get the lease. That's old saying, no lease, no grease. Got to get the lease. Once you get the lease, got to make sure it's a good lease. And then you got to get the land all surveyed and everything and just get the pipe. You got to, you know, you start producing, you got to have, get it out of there. And so. The more you talk about this, the more my mind is blown that this actually happens because you got to get the mineral rights. You got to get the surface rights, go through all the title to make sure that everything's clear, figure out where it is. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's city state permitting that you got to go through. Yeah. I mean. Oh, and don't even bring up the subject of drilling on government lands. That's a whole nother process. I mean, so with the same company, they closed their office down in Shreveport and, and they said, your job's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm like, well, I don't even know where that is. And I'm, well, I'm going, I don't know what else I'm going to do. Backing up a second. At what point did you get married? We graduated in 05, spring of 05. We got married that September, September 10th. Okay. And my mind almost blanked. I was, I, I was waiting. Nine, ten, yeah, 9, 10, 05. I knew. It was just before Katrina. Yeah. So, and what was Katie doing? She was educated in health, fitness, kinesiology, and she was serving as the regional YMCA fitness advisor. I okay. Think. Yeah. She was teaching aerobics and running the fitness program at YMCA. And that's when I was doing field work. And so our first two years of marriage, I was living in hotels. I'd get to see her two days a week. And that was part of what drove the curiosity too. It's like, okay, how do I finish? How do I, I love this business, but I'm not going to continue to sleep in a La Quinta every other week. It's not going to happen. How do I get home? How do I get home? Yeah. So you come home from work one day, hey, they're closing our office. How do you feel about Tulsa? What yeah, was that response? that was not good. That wasn't good because- All of her family, including siblings, all of my family, which was much smaller than hers, Shreveport, Shreveport. And we had just had our second child who was going to, hindsight, who did turn one the day we followed that moving van out of Shreveport. We celebrated his first birthday in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in a place we did not know anybody in a hotel with a little Blue Bell ice cream cup and a candle I found in the gift shop downstairs. Yeah. That was I imagine there were some. Yeah, teachers. she was. Yeah, but I said it a hundred times because it's the truth. We spent three years in Tulsa, almost to the day, and the tears, her tears leaving that town, were larger than they were going up there. That's such awesome. a great place to live. So you found you found community. Yeah, we found a great church. Great. I mean the the 
the culture there at the office that I worked at was fantastic. Our neighborhood, we just, God, I had his hand in everything. And so we met great people. The climate there is phenomenal. I don't know if you've been to Tulsa, but it's almost like there's a mother nature switch. When the calendar says it's spring, switch. It feels like spring. Winter, switch. Summer, switch. Fall. It's amazing. You actually have seasons. You did. Like here in North Texas. Yes, it was amazing. That's awesome. Yes. So you touched on something. You used the word culture. Mm -hmm. You talked about how the office in in Tulsa had a great culture. Was it different from the Shreveport culture? It was. And again, this is the same company. Same company. But at that time, it's a company that's 100 years old. It's crazy. It's the craziest thing. I'll never forget getting an email from the CEO. I'm still in Shreveport. Hey, this year we're turning 100 years old as a company. And every month you're going to get some sort of swag to commemorate the company and its birthday. You know what that company did the next year? Changed its name. (laughs) I'm like, wait a minute. We have all this stuff. And the reasoning behind it, as I understand it, and I get it, was that was when, you know, we talked about the Barnett Shale and up until then, oil and gas drilling was called conventional. Conventional meaning straight hole. It was a conventional way of drilling. Oil. We used up and down. Well, unconventional is now you're turning these things and you're drilling horizontal. Well, everyone starts kind of rebranding. We're no longer this 100-year-old conventional player. We're now unconventional, and we're going to shorten our name and a new logo. So, this, so the culture was different up there because they kind of were changing before everybody else. And uh, it was newer office space. Looked really nice, kind of like your place here, Scott. And just, and it felt good. So it was a different culture. Primarily it was driven because of the company was changing. Interesting. Yeah. And they were hiring a lot of younger people at that time too. It was because the energy programs with the foresight of, hey, unconventional petroleum engineers at AM, hey, this is the new thing. This is how you study reservoirs now, all these new technologies. Well, those, you know, when I came to this company, to the company at the time, I think I brought that average age of 40 people in that office down by 20 years. Oh, yeah. Wow. And so by the time I left, everyone looked like me. How many offices did they have? Uh, at the time, I think there was probably six across the country. And culture is just such a big, important thing to me. And, and what you said earlier just kind of set off this whole thought pattern. After the new brand was kind of settled on, do you think that the culture of the other offices kind of leveled out and had a similar feel or was there just a true distinct difference between HQ and and the regions? No, I think that company, they did a very good job at, you could walk in any one regional office and it almost, it looked the same, felt the same. So you didn't feel out of place when you would go visit different places. The only thing really different was the food. So you mentioned leaving Tulsa Mm -hmm. and that was a hard thing. How long were you there? Three years. And again, here comes curiosity creep. That's what really drew curiosity creep and wanting to get a little closer back home. We've now had our third child. I learned that Katie had a plan the whole time. I had no idea we were going to have three children. We had a boy and a girl. I mean, what do we, why do we need more children? But um, <laughs> one thing about Tulsa, at least our friends group, you have a litter, you don't have one or two. And so I think some of that influence rubbed off. And so we had our third child and we needed to get closer back home. These six hour one way or 12 hour trips back to see grandparents every month. It's just So where is that going to be? I didn't really want to go back to Shreveport. One, the energy business was quickly fading away there. People were moving out. And so where where can I go? Well, Dallas is pretty close. That's three hours. Now I've just cut everything down in half. And so I just started pulling out the Rolodex. Who would I know in the business? You know, just making some phone calls and I landed in Shreveport. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, in Dallas. I'm sorry, I landed in Dallas. Okay. I landed in Dallas and I left nine years in the publicly traded energy space to private equity backed energy space, two different animals. You do the same thing. You still drill the same wells, but how you plan and budget and and the projects you take on or don't take on are two or driven two different ways. Mentality is totally different. Yeah. I call that my six year MBA, if you will. What were the biggest differences between the two? Oh my gosh. It really comes down to just how money's handled and how you make decisions. When you're working for a big three, $4 billion publicly traded company, you move at a different pace. Your risk reward profile is completely different. Is it safe to assume that the PE was spend the money, let's move, fast decision, how quick can we get a return? Yes, it's all return. It's more ROR versus ROI. Yeah, it's that rate. It's that rate. Yeah. Yeah. And I came in, I believe, kind of at the tail end of, It was very attractive because when the energy business went from conventional to unconventional, 
private equity, specifically, there's a group called NCAP out there that they got really good at finding and taking young guns from these big public companies and putting together these management teams, giving them a $300 million blank check and saying, go. And at that time, it was really more land play driven of getting in front of these public companies that would move slower. So the small independent little management teams, you know, let's say me and you, we just got a $300 million check and we just go. We're very nimble, very nimble. We can make our own decisions. We could just get on technology, a computer and say, well, there's a bunch of rigs here. It looks like they're moving this way. Let's go lease up land in front of them. When you do that, well, guess what? Exxon needs to keep moving. So they're going to go pay you 10X on what you just paid. And it was just very lucrative. It was very attractive, very sexy. Now, everyone was successful at it. I mean, there's a lot of ways around that rig. And if you guess wrong, you got burned. And that's what made the, a big difference between good and bad teams. And so I kind of came in on the tail end of that. Private equity, we were still doing that, but the opportunities were still getting fewer and far between. Is that because they're just... The land grabs were kind of over. And now it was more A&D of just people's positions and companies and how does their balance sheet look? And are, are they at the end of their cycle of private equity? It, just, it was different. And in the PE business, were you really just holding the rights and flipping the rights or were you guys actually? Oh, no, we were drilling. Yeah, we were full-blown operating team. It was amazing. 10 people in the office doing the same thing that a office of 60 or 70 publicly traded guys would do. Wow. Yeah. It's just, it's amazing. And it's not a knock against my old company. I see it everywhere. I mean, but there's just a lot of fat out there that can be trimmed when you're doing anything. You know, I've learned it in my existing business. I've cut labor in half and I'm still doing the same thing I was doing last year. Which did you enjoy more? I liked them both. I wouldn't have found my way on a private equity team starting out. There's just no room for a novice that, that you've got to have some sort of experience. They were both great. They were both great. I think the most rewarding was the, my last, call it three years when we stood up our own company, when it, we being two engineers, my last two business partners and I, we went and we went and got our $150 million check and hired some very good people and bought some assets, drilled some wells, had some success. I mean, that was very rewarding, but very stressful. So how long were you at the the PE backed company? Yeah. So when I came to Dallas, when the, the family, we came down here, we went to work. I went to work for a management team that was already put together, backed by natural gas partners. And they had already had their commitment and we spent two years, I was on the land team, trying to find something to acquire, trying to find something that was already produced. And real quick, this is like 2010, 11, or 11, 12. 2012, 13-ish. Yep. I spent two years trying to find assets to acquire that were producing cash flow, cash flowing, and we couldn't really find anything. By the time you get a deal on the line, commodity prices would drop down. You know, it's always like a falling knife. And we finally said, you know what, let's go put together our own property. Our own deal. And so we ended up putting together a bunch of land leases up in Oklahoma, drilling some wells. And our backer got tired of, call it the team, call it the properties, and really wanted to sell them, flush them. We weren't ready. And so myself and two of the engineers that worked there said, why don't we buy these properties ourselves? We believe in them still. They've been mismanaged potentially. So we need to find money. And so we just, we went to our, private equity provider at the time and said, hey, it could be viewed as we staged a coup, but we didn't. We just said, you know, if these guys are going to be done with it, we're not done and we don't want to just go down with the ship. So we're young, we have families and let's go for it. So we went to the private equity sponsor at the time and said, would you allow us to go try to find money and buy this from ourselves, from you? And we got the green light. And so that's what we did. So you got three kids, Mm -hmm. you're, I don't know, early, mid thirties. I'm now about late thirties now. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? You've had kind of the safety and security of a W2 job all these years. What's going on in your mind? What was the conversation like at home? It was fight or flight. It was, it was, I did not want to go back to the public world because now I've kind of become not my own boss, but now I'm in the small world and it's great. And I didn't want to go back to making widgets. If you would, I wanted, I like being out here, super nimble and let's go big projects, potential, you know, it's skin in the game. So should the stars align, you make a big lick or you do a lot better, if you will, than sitting there collecting a paycheck every two weeks at a public company. There's nothing wrong with that. Energy business is great that you make, you can make great money and not even have an education to boot. But I just didn't want to go back. And I'd gotten a taste of that. And I just saw a way of, man, if, if I've got the will and I got 
two engineers here that are truly trust that have the will. And so we literally, we would, as things were kind of starting to show themselves that we're, this thing's going to wind down, we would our, spend our lunches down in the uh, public, I don't call it dinner hall, whatever, at the building, your, your cafeteria space with a yellow legal pad and say, okay, what do you want to do? How does this look? What's our company name going to be? Where are we going to get the money? How are we going to do this? Do we want to do this? Here's the chart if we don't do it. You're going to go. Do, and so we stacked hands and went for it. For your two partners, mm-hmm. were, were y'all friends outside of work or were you really just work? Well, it's funny. We actually met back in the public company days in Shreveport. We all worked together back on an asset team way back in the day. So we actually, so when we're making these decisions and having these meetings, do we want to go get our own money? We'd actually worked together on and off through our careers for about 10 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. And was everybody all in, totally on board? Yeah, we were. And one thing I learned through that is, I think it's very important that you're kind of the same like mind and position in life to kind of, because what we were viewing was we had management our existing management at the time, they were in different, it was kind of oil and watery and it just wasn't working. And and I think some of our su- successes we were having once we got off and running, we stacked hands, we got funded. We were all like kind of in the same part of our lives, you know, young families and all like-minded and not necessarily voted the same, but just we all had the same goals and aspirations. That's just do what you say you're going to do, put your head down, go to work and trust God's going to take care of the rest. We're all believers. It just all was just, in fact, we named our company Acacia Exploration, uh, the partners, and it was biblical based. Acacia Wood. Uh huh. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So, what was it like having two other partners? How did you guys make decisions? That's a great question. I did not realize until this current venture I'm in, and this is no disrespect to my partner, which is my wife on paper of this um, venture I'm in now, but having partners. I mean, I've said it, I've said it so many times. I'm blue in the face now, hindsight. I wouldn't do what I'm doing now. I had it. If I could do over, I wouldn't do what I'm doing now without partners. Really? Yes. Yes. Wow. And that's just been my experience because you have a sounding board. You're not making decisions in a vacuum. You're just kind of, it's three legs to a stool, if you will. You're, hey, Scott, this is what I'm thinking. I woke up this morning. I'm go- we're, We need to do this. And you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, remember, we, this is not what we talked about. Oh, Whereas I don't really have that check balance and and I can be one, I hear it all the time. Like, man, you do, you move a lot. You pivot. I'm like, well, I just pivot. And I don't really have those three legs, you know, those two other two legs. And so what was the question? How did you guys make decisions? Was that a a positive thing? We sat around in meetings a lot. (laughs) A lot. I jokingly say, I I grew a root up my butt every day. I felt like in chairs, (laughs) but um, man, it was great. But it was also a natural, it was natural. It's, One's a petroleum engineer, one's a reservoir engineer. I'm a land guy. So we all brought different lenses, if you will. You know, it wasn't three petroleum engineers or three land men or three accountants. So it wasn't a big echo chamber. It was, we all had different points of views and reasonings of why we would make decisions. Yeah. I think that's hugely important. Mm-hmm. You, you, I assume you had a little bit more of the business side and they had the more execution. Here's how we go about this kind of. You bet. I didn't know anything about rock mechanics or anything about volume displacement. And so I respected them and really, truly valued and wanted to learn about that stuff as much as I could on a high level. But I also got the same respect back from them of, hey, we can't just go do that over there on Farmer Bob's land. And here's why. But the contract says we can't. But we are good people and we're going to live. We're going to be an operator of choice. And so we always had this respect and it worked out. It's a good team. Great team. That's huge. Just because you can do something, just because it's allowed by the contract doesn't mean no. that you should. Mm-mm. And I think there's a lot of people out there, a lot of businesses that don't operate like that. That's right. Yeah. And we kind of borrowed slash stole that public company that are, that both Brandon, Melissa, and I, my two partners that we're speaking of, we're at St. Mary Land and Exploration. And that CEO, Tony Best, uh, that was there while we were there during our tenure, he just had some great just great mission statements. And one of them being, we're going to be operator of choice. It just always stuck with me and it stuck with my two partners. And we carried that over to Acacia and we live by that. We want to be an operator of choice. And you're not an operator of choice if you're mowing down and disrespecting the people that, you know, without their land, you ain't nothing. You know, and at the end of the day, that's, that's really where the rubber hits the road. The right thing to do is the right thing to do regardless. But 
when other people are looking at leasing out their land and they're talking to farmer Bob, who, who you were on, when they hear, hey, who treated you well, who didn't? I mean, well, and it's also partner of choice too. I, I, in business, you partner with people, other businesses, and we always wanted to be the partner of choice. We wanted people to call us because they knew that if we said we we're going to do something, we we're going to do it. Even if it hurt, if we'd be if like, man, we should have never committed that. We'd do it. I, I've carried that into what I'm doing now. If you're going to say you're going to do something, do it. Absolutely. It means a lot. I'm glad to hear the partner model worked well for you because there's a lot of stories to the counter to that. And it's great to hear when it works well. It does. Now, doesn't mean it's easy. <laughs> you know, got to humble yourself a lot. Sometimes you get into partnerships that you, you know, as soon as that honeymoon's over, you sure as, you, how do we get out of it? Did you guys ever have any disagreements that were really difficult to work through? Probably. I'll speak from my experience. And if Melissa ever listened to this, she would respect that. And what I learned or what we went through, Brandon, Melissa and I, and I guess we're talking about my last three years in the energy business here. My communication skills just suck sometimes. And probably not sometimes, probably a lot of times. I am a bad assumer, meaning I assume things. I assume people know what I'm thinking and can make decisions based on, well, they already know or they know why I'm doing this. And Melissa is a mother, a wonderful mother. Brandon is a father, a wonderful father. I'm a father. And when you got, you enter dynamic of, you've got two men and a woman in, the, in a partnership, you've got to treat Melissa a little different than Brandon. Not treat, but you talk different, right? And he, everyone has their different needs. Brandon's got different needs than Melissa does. I have different needs. And she taught me so much of, she's not Brandon, right? She's a woman. And I hope this isn't coming across as like sex, but she needed to be treated different or she needed to be talked to different. Her language was different. That's what I'm trying to say. Not treated. Her language was different than Brandon's. And I communicate. Brandon and I could high five in the break room and say, yeah, we're doing the same. Boom. And not tell Melissa. Well, Melissa needed to be involved in that. And if Melissa and I high five and made a decision about Brandon, it didn't really affect him as much, or maybe he didn't share it as much. And so Melissa and I got really close because I could almost bank about every six months, my door was going to slam and that's with her it behind her, her coming to my office and giving it to me, just giving me the business. And it resulted most of the time with me in tears saying, I'm so sorry. But those encounters just strengthened our partnership. It really did. And she knew I never would do anything or make any decision out of spite. And I knew she wouldn't either, but it was always just like, there goes Clayton assuming again that she knew or it just, I don't know where I'm going with that, but being able to say you're sorry yeah, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that pride just won't let them. Yeah. And so I'm glad to hear that you weren't afraid to say those words. Yeah. So you were with them for three years? Yeah, three years. And what caused that to come to an end? Oil going negative in 2020. I think it was March. I, I swore I would never forget the date. But when oil went negative, we're at home. I'll never forget where I was at. We'd gotten funded. Brandon Melissa, we'd gotten funded, put the team together. We got the old regime out the door. No disrespect to them. Just we bought the assets. You know, one of the hardest things I've done in that energy career was buying my own assets. Imagine spending a million dollars in legal fees buying your own house from you from yourself. And the next day you still wake up in the same bed. Yeah. So you know, buying our own assets, we got through all of that, learned about what an ISDA is and, and all these, I mean, bank debt, it was, we learned so much and we got through all that and stayed in our old digs for about eight months and we, our lease was coming due and we said, well, we got to move our office, what we're going to do. And we settled over by the Galleria, great office, put our touches on it. And about five months later, COVID hits, we go home. And we're all sitting there working and we're now doing some consolidating for our sponsor. We're taking out other teams and all through COVID and I'm watching all go negative. And that's what I'm going, our number is going to be up. And it sure enough, it was, our number came up, meaning we were going to get consolidated, meaning our team was going to go home. And naturally you would say, well, if, if the end of the road's near, we'll do what you did earlier, go get some more money. And do, well, no, 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 all went negative that year. No one's giving anybody any money, not in that space. And so I knew that. And I was very fearful of just sitting around and waiting for that downturn, if you will, at the time to iron itself out, which would it ever. We got a new administration coming in, killing energy. Like, I'm not going to be a part of that. No way. So 
when you say you got consolidated, does that mean your your backer pulled the plug and said, hey, yeah. we're going to take this and roll it up under? That's right. And so at that time, uh, was Kane Anderson was our sponsor, our backer, our partner. And we were operating assets up in the mid-continent in Oklahoma. And there was also two or three other operating teams, also royalty companies, mineral companies, under this in the same fund operating in the same basin all had their own management teams and so i mean you cut gna deep put it all under one team with the plan of taking it public potentially and we we threw our name in the hat to be those consolidators and i think we could have done it but one of my partners wanted to be done for a little while and completely respected that and it changed the dynamic and i said well well if that person's going home i don't Hey, I love you, but, you know, I think I'm gonna do something different too, you know, and and I'm just praying about it. Like I did something different. Was that a hard conversation? No, not really. Yes, (laughs) but no. Melissa, she wanted to go be mom. And when she sat there and said, I want to go home, I just said, we're going to help you go home. And then that left her leaving the room and Brandon and I looking at each other going, well, do you want to keep going? And naturally said, yeah, let's do it. And we did. It's not like we sat on our hands. We pulled out the Rolodex, you know, started go climbing every tower in Dallas. Hey, what are y'all doing? Do you want to sell this asset? You need a partner. We got a team. We're going to end up going home. If but we can do these things, we can operate your assets. Hey, non-operator. And nothing would really stick. And I just kept looking at the calendar going, I'm not, I'm going to give this thing till about October and I'm going to make a decision. That's what I did. And Katie was on board. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's wonderful. She'd jump off the bridge with me, I think. Well, no, she wouldn't, but she's that type. She just, you know, she knows I'm a dreamer. And I kept thinking about, you know, what else could we do? And she's been a big fan. I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Before we get deeper into what you're doing today, you talked about oil going negative. And I remember that being all over the news. For the uneducated, like myself, does that mean that oil companies are literally paying people Mm -hmm. to take the oil? Yes. Yes, that is true. And there was even a bigger issue is there was no one to take the oil. Storage was full. Cushing, I mean, we were blessed to be where our assets were up uh, Cushing. We could still get oil out, but it wasn't at a pace we needed to. And we were having to build these huge, which was very risky. Lightning could strike one tank and you lose everything. We were having to stockpile oil, but we were hedged. And so in, in the energy business, you can hedge you can hedge that commodity. And so, but you're only as good as your counterparty. But oil went negative. We were still selling barrels at $56. Yes. So it didn't affect our balance sheet, but it sure affected the sentiment in the industry. People going knew what forward. was coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when you talk about the storage was full, you had no place to put it. Is that because, hey, we're in COVID, people aren't driving their cars, we're not burning and we don't, we just don't need it. So there was no draw. It was a demand issue. And that's right. There was no draw. And the industry got really good at what it was doing and it was producing a lot of oil. And that's what happened. The energy business is its own worst enemy. And you're always chasing the price. Natural gas is starting to trade up. Boy, let's go produce gas. Well, we're so good at it. We put too much supply out there. Guess what? Price goes down and it shuts the projects down. People lose their jobs. Well, oil starts going up. I and mean, that's what happened was. Barnett Shell, big gas, unconventional, and everyone's, well, gas, natural gas is trading at $15 an M, you know, and blah, 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 boom. We crushed gas. It went down to $2. Guess what? Oil. We can do that same stuff in oil. It didn't take a wise man to figure out we're going to do the same thing that he did. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, just how long it takes to actually get something through the, the whole mm-hmm. process. You're looking at the spot price today, but it's going to be six months, a year, two years before you actually start pulling stuff out of the ground. So you're making decisions on yes. a price today that may not be that price by the time you actually start pulling it out. Yeah, there's it's what the industry uses, what's called a strip. And the strip's never right. But it's a guidepost of, well, the industry says in 12 months, it'll be this, 24 months will be this, 36 months will be this. And you plug that in your model. And if the project works based on strip with some sort of discount, typically you go. And that's where you're, you're your risk profiles by different companies and cultures change. I mean, some people take strip and don't discount anything and go. And you're always like, oh my God, they're idiots. But hey, sometimes those guys are geniuses. <laughs> it's <laughs> It sounds like luck. Timing's everything in that industry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how does Clayton go from yeah. the energy world yeah. to 
Flurry's market. Yeah, I don't know. Really, I don't know. I mean, I wanted to do something. I had to do something. And so I just literally came home from church in November of 2020, I think. Yeah. I'll never forget coming home from church in 2020 and sat on the couch, turned on some football and looked over. There was a purple spiral notebook. I think it was my daughter's. And I just flipped to the back to some free paper and said, what do I know? What have I done? Who do I want to be? I'm 42. And so I just started penciling out the whole pros, cons, and, you know, do I stay in energy? Yes, no. And I kept going. Energy just didn't, I didn't see a path because I just knew it would take some time. No one was hiring. Everyone was firing. There was no money. And so I really just, that pencil to paper just immediately just went bent to something different. And I didn't want to go to real estate school or I have to go to school. I said, well, what have I done? So I had to actually go, what have you done in life? Well, I wasn't going to go back in the military. So, uh, well, and I worked in a meat market when I got out of the army. I did that. I really enjoyed that. And I still know the guy that owns that same meat market that I worked in. I um, worked in a prep kitchen. I bartended. I washed dishes in college for four years. I like food. I like service. I really like my town. What does this town not have? Well, would I, would one of those meat markets work over here? This is truly, this is exactly how it went. Yeah, I'm going to open a meat market. That's what I'm going to do. So you put that purple spiral that was it. book down and you yeah. got to find Katie and say, here's what's next, babe. Yeah, well, I well, I think I then reached over and grabbed my laptop with the next to the purple uh, notebook. And I said, do meat markets make money? Google. Well, I didn't get any results. So I started making phone calls, made phone calls. And I called my buddy Ross that owned uh, Maxwell's Market in Shreveport, Louisiana that I worked in back in 2001, I think. To Ross, you've been doing this for 20 years. Would you do it again? And you know, I, I have to preface before I made that phone call and I shared Katie with the idea. She says, I don't want to be married to a business. I don't want to be married to a store. I don't want to do it. Okay, I right, hear you. Hey, Ross, would you do this again? He goes, well, you know, I'm I, Maureen and I, his wife, we don't have kids. And so I live here at the store and it's easy for me because I don't have kids. And I was like, oh my God, the first thing he told me is what Katie said she didn't want to do. But you know me, I'm smart. Right. I'm like, oh, well, I'm not going to tell Katie he said that he's going to be married. I'm going to be married <laughs> to the store because I'm going to do this thing corporately. I'm not going to run this thing like a traditional mom and pop where the man or woman's name that's on the door is the butcher. It's got to be there. I'm going to I'm going to do this kind of more of a, a white collar corporate fashion. And I'm going to hire people to do this thing. No different. Jeff Bezos. He's not the butcher at, at Whole Foods. He runs Amazon. He just opens to own Whole Foods. And I still haven't given that up. I still haven't given that up. I haven't seen the light at the end of the tunnel, but. So I said, okay, I can get beyond that. What else? He goes, well, if you can get past that, it's been one of the most rewarding things I've done. This is Ross telling me this. I said, okay, tell me why. He goes, well, you're going to meet families come in these doors. They're going to bring their kids in there on a Saturday after soccer practice. They're going to get an icy from the icy machine. And you're going to get to watch those kids grow up. And those kids are going to have kids. And it's just, and he, everything he describes it, that's what I'm looking for in life. Service and part of the community and you know, I'm kind of my boss and this is my store and it's not a new concept. Meat markets and corner stores have been around for centuries, you know, or century, you know, getting sugar, go get a pack of smokes and sugar down the street. I don't sell cigarettes with sugar, but I was like, okay, well, Ross, do you mind if I come visit you and see it again? And he did. So the summer, we made the commitment to do this thing. I said, Katie, I think that's what we're going to do. And so I went to my standing business partner and said, I'm out too, buddy. I'm going to go be a meat man in Flower Mound, Texas. That's what we did. And so my neighbor's an attorney. He's a good friend. And I said, man, how do I stand up an LLC on my own here? And so he helped me do that. And in March of 2021, Foreign Flurries Market and Provisions LLC. A year after the pandemic yes. shut everything down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What gave you the courage to do that? My experience in the energy because I was scared to death when we moved to Dallas. I was working for first private equity company, number one management team. I was scared to death when I saw that thing winding down and said, okay, this is where I can either be scared and get ride this wave until it hits the shore and I have no job or go work back for making widgets for a big public company or let's go do this ourselves. 
And man, that was such a hard process. That was, I really think it took years off my life because we found the funding, the deal died, it revived itself, it died again, revived itself. And we got through that and I said, well, I mean, this is, and I just kind of, and I fell in love with the process of starting a company. I was like, man, this is great. So, well, man, can I kind of know how to do this? You know, form a corporate, go form it on paper and go. You got to, so what do you need? You need, you need capital, you need people, both resources. Go get the resources you need and roll. That's what we did. So November of 2020, you have the idea. Mm -hmm. March of 21 is when you formed the LLC. And I turned out my lights March 31st at the energy company and walked out. How long from then until you opened the store? Yeah. We opened December 13th, 2021. On paper, I was supposed to be open September 1st. We had some conversations running each other around town or at school events, and I got to hear a little bit of what it took to get the doors open. Talk about that for a minute. This podcast going another six hours. It was a very expensive learning experience. And I wish, hindsight, there's a lot of things I wish I'd have done and use that time more wisely. I wish I had a partner going into it. Did no. you wish that at the time or is this no, a reflection? No. It's a reflect. These are reflections. Reflections. So, and, and here's why. I just left the energy business of 17, 18 years. I'm starting a business in a whole different industry. I don't know anything about. My experience in it was as a hourly earner, not an hourly owner, if you will. And so I'm, I'm sitting here building a company on spreadsheets and building margins and pro forma based on what I get off Google. What's the margin on groceries? What's hourly wages these days? I was wrong on all of it. And so, man, I sure wish I had someone that was alongside me that said, you're an idiot. Margin on beef isn't that. You're going to be paying people twice what you have on that piece of paper right there. Payroll tax is this. I came from that company that Brandon and Melissa and I were running. Well, we had a straight up CPA down the hall as our CFO. I mean, or not CPA, a CFO down the hall. You know, that took care of that stuff. So... I do all that now. <laughs> yeah. Sourcing a payroll provider. I mean, all these things that standing all that up was such a tremendous learning experience and getting equipment timely. People are now, we're still, you know, now we're on the back end. I'll say the back end. We're still kind of on the, we're not in the, th masks are starting to go away, but supply chain screwed up. Everything's screwed up. Need sheetrock, can't get it. You need refrigeration, can't get it. 10 week lead times become 20 week lead times. And so how do you timely hire through all that? Well, you do the best you can. We literally carried payroll for almost 90 days without a dollar coming in that door. So you, you had hired. Oh yeah. And to retain the, the talent that I'm sure you had to search long and hard for. Oh yeah. You had to pay them even though there wasn't really yeah, a job there was nothing for them to do. to do. There was nothing to do. I had to make up stuff. Hey guys, meet at the coffee shop. Go home. Here's homework come give us a presentation on how to cut a fish or come tell us about the history of dry aging beef. It was purposeful. It wasn't really adding much value, but yeah. And between equipment and town regulations and rules and you can't do this, you can't do this. Oh, by the way, this is just, man, it took a lot longer than I sure thought it would. But in all lessons cost, right? I had a mentor tell me all lessons cost. That one cost, cost a lot, but we're still there. We're figuring it out. Hearing you talk about, I need a time clock. I need a payroll person. I need this and that. I think a lot of people underestimate all of the little things. Like there are plenty of big things, right? Get the LLC form. That's kind of a big thing. Get the lease for the building done. Get the permits. Get, But there are so many of those little things that I think people just think, yeah, they, they just happen. Mm. No, they don't. Somebody like you has to figure it out and get it done. Oh yeah. I mean, tax filings, and I mean, insurance and you know, state of Texas is the only state in the country, at least it was last year or whenever I formed this thing that you do not by law have to carry a workers comp. Right. And so as a business owner, you could be like, well, I could save that money. Well, I'm like, well, I'm, I got guys that are running meat saws and grinders. I better not skip out on that. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. Hey, I need ice. Well, I need to get an ice machine. Well, restaurants have Coke. Machine. How do I get a, how do I even get a Coke machine? Where do I get the groceries from? I don't, there's a lot of self-teaching through that process, but that, that sounds good. I had a lot of great people to show up in my life. Who are some of those people? 
Oh gosh. Some of my food suppliers, my vendors. It's amazing how you just make one phone call. There's a well-known restaurateur in the Flower Mound, Bartonville area that he champions a particular farm, 44 Farms Beef. I said, okay, well, I'm a meat shop and I'm going to leverage and ride his wave of marketing. This town already knows that farm. It's Texas. It's local. So I'm going to sell that beef. Well, how do I get it? I don't know. Google, 44 Farms phone number. So I called 44 Farms. Get a hold of a gentleman. He said, well, hey, yeah, that's cool. You're going to open a butcher shop. We'd be glad to talk to you, but we don't self-distribute our beef. You got to go through this company. I said, okay, well, who do I call there? We'll call this person. And it's just that mezzanine of, of just that chain of people that now I'm talking to a food supplier that doesn't just sell that beef. They sell tortillas and toilet mints and everything, you know, everything you need to kind of supply a restaurant or a grocery store, if you will. And and then those people have their suppliers and it's just, just this big chain. And and it really is funny. It's one phone call to 44 Farms. That, yeah, it's interesting. That's at the trajectory. <laughs> yeah. So I hadn't even thought about that. So you got the distributor is for for that. How many distributors, how many partners do you have? Because you don't just sell meat. Mm-hmm. You got beer and wine. You got produce. Yeah. You, you got candles. I got it. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm the only meat shop in the world. It smells like candles when you walk in there. That's Katie's influence. Yes, that's Katie's influence. So I was naive. There were so many things that I came out pounding the table at the beginning. I was like, I'm never going to run ads. I'm not going to run discounts. I want to be the Rolex meat markets, but be for every man. I was all these things I'm going to do. I'm going to have one supplier. I just wanted to have one. That was stupid. That No, man. You have a bunch of suppliers. Keep those guys honest. Took me a while to figure that out. Because if you have one supplier, how do you know you're getting the best price? I mean, the guy's looking at your eyes saying, that's a good price. Well, I learned. No, no, no. You get multiple suppliers that sell the same thing. You keep those guys honest. And then I learned later that you can even put contracts in place that kind of lock in your margins or, or the percentages above what their costs are, what you're going to pay for goods. That sure helps you with your balance sheet. Man, I learned a lot. But yeah, I used to pound the tape because I wanted it to be simple. If one thing went wrong, didn't show up on time, it was one person I'm calling, not like, well, which vendor was that or which... No, more is better. So you start paying people in September mm-hmm. and you don't open until December. The night before you opened, what was going through your mind? Are there butterflies in your stomach? Are you are you able to sleep that night? You know, my pants didn't fit anymore, not because I got fat, because I'd lost so much weight. And Katie did too. Our mirrors kind of reflect each other in the bathroom. And then we both hit at the same time, like, we've lost like 10, 15 pounds the past two, three months. We were running ragged. I mean, just... It's just the stress of just, it all. Yeah. I mean, because it's the putting on finishing touch. It's going to open the doors, all this stuff. And there's just so much. Once the equipment's running, okay, now we got to stock it. Got to get the food in. Da, da, da. And that's the time. I mean, it's it's raw product. And, like, and the timing of getting that ordered and getting it cut and getting it filled and and not changing the opening date and it's just to getting your certificate of occupancy. I mean, the town may say, yeah, you're going to get approved tomorrow, but until you do, and, and then it's just, hey, they don't deliver food on Sundays. And so it's just, a, it's just man, that coming together opening those doors that first day I think I did sleep I don't know I know I lost a lot of weight and I have to give credit to my team I meant remember when I said when I first went in-house at an energy company I was scared to death but I quickly realized I just got to surround myself with smart people well that's what we did here in hiring I hired probably one of the best young butchers in the Metroplex I hired two great fishmongers fishmonger they just know everything about seafood sources, how to cut them, everything. Some really good counter help, a chef at the time. And so they were really there and they kind of helped me stay balanced, if you will. I would look at them like, is this normal? Do we have this? And they, they taught me so much that if I'd brought, and this isn't anything against the butcher shop back at home, but if I'd brought the butcher shop culture of hometown Shreveport, Louisiana to Flower Mound, Texas, I'd have gotten crucified. I'd have gotten buried. It wouldn't have worked. It's just done. It's just a different demographic. Things were done different. Over there in my hometown, they could sell what's called no-roll beef, meaning it's not graded by the USDA inspector and get away with it just fine. But here, people want prime. Yep. People want quality. Not that that's not quality, but it's just a different market. Yep. And that's what I knew. That was the education I was bringing over here. But I was surrounded by people that knew better, that worked in this market for several years, if not more than a decade, um, in some cases that it got us across the finish line of opening. Knowing your customer mm-hmm. and knowing that the 
customer in Flower Mound is different than the customer in Shreveport. Yes. That's huge. Oh, yes. That's huge. Um, so opening day, mm-hmm. did it meet your expectations? Do you remember the day? I do. I do. I do. I do remember it. It was wild. I think I cried in the bathroom several times um, of just more of just joy. It's kind of like you finished. I mean, I've never run a marathon. I've run a 5K or two, but just that you've worked so hard on something for so long. I mean, it's literally, I mean, from the time I sat down with that purple spiral notebook, it's been over a year now, right? From when we opened those doors on December 13th, 2021. And so it was just a lot. And my balance sheet shows that I didn't know what the hell I was doing because we were just spending, I, I had the oil field mentality of just spend money, just just go. But boy, in that bit, in this industry, pennies matter. I bet. Pennies matter. And so I was just so, it was just a lot. It's just a lot of moving parts. I remember coming in within the first week or two. I wanted to come the first day and I think I was traveling or something, but I feel like a weekend you had a refrigeration problem. Yeah, that was a little bit further down the road, but yes, we did have one of those. Quite interesting. You made all this investment. Oh yeah. And your equipment just goes. On a Friday. Yeah. So in the in the meat industry or in the the corner butcher shop industry, Friday you live and die by Fridays and Saturdays and we are open Sundays now, but those days too. And uh, I'll never forget coming in and one of my employees said, hey, boss, we got a problem on a Friday morning. I said, what's the problem? He goes, man, the meat in there is like 80 degrees. Said, no, come on. Really? And it's 24 feet of meat case. And we had just stocked it the night before trying to get ahead of the weekend. And, and we lost a lot of product. Is, but, your, is your stomach just turning? Uh, you know, I had to just laugh about it. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? Okay. Well, what is working? That case is working. That refrigerator's working. Well, we open in an hour, guys. Get this stuff out of here. Get that one returned over, you know, and take, fill that one full of beef. Get those potato salads out of there and do this and do that. And we just did the best we could. And you know what's funny? It was a Friday. We operated that day with 24 less feet of product, which is a lot of product, by the way. We made more money that Friday than we had any Friday till up to that date. That's awesome. And that taught me a lesson that our product mix was wrong. We didn't need some of those products. And so we got rid of them. It was interesting. There was a lot that came out of that day, a lot. You know, we had some team, some particular guys on the team came and said, you know, boss, you handled that real well. We've had some bosses in the past that were just lost it. So, well, thank you for that. I just didn't know what else to do. I was probably just going stir crazy and it looked like I was happy, but I really wasn't. But I also learned a lot about P-Mix and, and there's a lot of things we were carrying we didn't need to carry. P-Mix, product, product mix. mix. Yep, uh-huh. And you know what I did too, that same day I called my old mentor, Ross, at Shreveport, Louisiana Butcher Shop. I said, hey, have you ever had this happen to you? Yeah, you'll get through it. I said, did you ever like call insurance and file a claim on that? No, don't do that. You'll probably need it for a bigger disaster later. I said, oh, okay. Well, I didn't heed that. I called insurance. I called my broker. I said, what do you think? He said, just file it. Well, it's a God thing that it did because cash flow got real tight about four months later in the summer. And I went and checked the mail one day and there was a check that it covered our rent that month. It was a blessing. Had those cases not gone down and me filed that claim, I don't know. I'd, you know, line of credit. So it was just, it was one of those things, you know, you're like, it's kind of life gives you lemons. Make lemonade. Is that how it goes? Yeah. You've rolled with the punches yeah. quite a bit. Have to. Man, are there any other standout stories in the, what, coming up on two years that y'all have been open? Man. You know, yes, probably none that just, just, just to mind. I mean, it's really been just more to me. It's, it comes to the forefront of my mind as experience. It's just been quite the experience, Scott, because I left a world of, I didn't really know what was going to happen every day because you really don't know the field, but you did know you're going to come home when you're kind of ready to. And if you didn't call any landowners, you knew you weren't really going to get yelled at. But, you know, in this industry, it's service. It's not energy. It's retail. It's not energy. And consumers with social media have got a lot of power. And you can do a lot of things right. But if you misstep at the wrong time with the wrong customer, wrong consumer, it could be like a big stick out of nowhere that's just damage control. And I don't have any specifics that come to mind, but you just got to be on your toes every every second of every day and you layer it with customers because, again, one-star review or you didn't have this or this 
this product didn't meet my expectations or that employee looked at me wrong or, you know, that's just from the customer facing part. Well, now you got to deal with the employees. And then the, you know, I'll come in every day and the lights flicker and I got to get up there and hammer these, these LED lights, man, they just don't make things like they used to. You know, back in the, work in the daycare days, those lights started acting up, you change the ballast and you're good. It's always something, mechanical, something, and it's, it can wear on you. Yeah. It can wear on you. You touched on social, but you, you touched on a different aspect than I was thinking about. You guys kill it with social. You've always got fresh mm-hmm. posts and they're always fun and funny. Who does your social? Is that you? Yeah, it's me. And that's funny. That's a good question because the strategic plan was Katie, my partner, who owns 51% of this company. People always ask, do I own this? I say, no, Katie doesn't just work here. You handle social media. And that was a touchy subject. It kind of became touchy because that was what we were supposed to do. She does social media. Well, I became kind of the in the grind of things every day behind the meat counter, in the cutting room, in the kitchen. And I would kind of do some social media. Then it's like, well, wait, you're supposed to, but I'm, and so it's really a transition to where I do it now, just naturally. And uh, there's been a lot of learnings there. And was that something you knew a lot about? No, I still don't know a lot about. It's funny you asked that question because yesterday I was so happy. My daughter who's just turned 15. I said, Brennan, did you know that you could record your screen on your iPhone? I, did you see my post? I recorded my screen checking out our website. She's like, dad, really? <laughs> so, anyhow, I think I'll do a thing, but yeah, there's, there's a lot to learn, but we're blessed to live. And that's a change that we've recently made. I mean, we were running print ads, you know, we we're doing a lot of print advertising. I say a lot. We were running print advertising and I looked at my p last year and I, I just started looking at it and go, man, I feel like I'm getting more bang for my buck. No buck, really, just free social media. And I could put out there, hey, we're giving away bacon. And well, I better have a lot of bacon because people look at that and they're in the store within seconds. My wife sent me up here. They saw your thing. It works. Amen. That's yeah. awesome. So one of the things you talked about at kind of the beginning of the story about starting flurries was getting to watch the family come in after their soccer game on a, on a Saturday afternoon and watch these kids grow up. Have you got to experience some of that and other things that you were hoping for that you've seen? Absolutely. I have, I say it a lot. This is a hard business in a sense you're dealing with. Okay. Let me back up. I'm building a brand. I've literally entered a market surrounded by big box stores, good ones, whole foods, sprouts, Walmart neighborhood groceries right across the street from me. There's a few Kroger's, Tom Thumbs. And here it is. I'm coming in here saying, hey, Flurry's Market. That's my last name. You should come buy your food from me. Even though I know it's going to be inconvenient because I don't have kitty litter over there too. You have to make another stop. You got to come to me. And the point of me sharing that is it's been a slow process to build cash flow. It's a monthly business. It's a monthly, man, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this. Well, maybe. Now, granted, Year over year, we're up 20, 30%. It's great. It's working. It's actually working. The model's working. And what it, where I'm going with this is, if I didn't have to worry about that bottom line, I'm convinced I'm where I'm supposed to be. Because on the days I don't have to worry about the bottom line and child number one comes in, or Mary, who just became a widow, who intentionally drove to our store to tell me that Bob passed away and she wanted us to know, and to be able to hug her and embrace her and then sit her down and have coffee with her in our store and share and cry with her, pray with her. That's it. It's everything. It's everything. And so should this store start being able to throw off cash and then that we can, my goal here, literally, and I tell my employees, and I probably shouldn't have told them so early because I don't want them to lose trust in me. I want this to be a profitable business to give them the opportunity to, in a industry that you don't really make money and make money, give it back to them because they're the ones that make it work. They're the ones that come in and make and get their job done, most of them. And so, man, there's a girl, she came to Ava. She brought me a picture and it's still hanging on my front. I got, there's nothing on my front glass and it's just it's eight and a half by 11. She she brought, she brought came in the other day and just, Mr. Flurry, Mr. Flurry, I brought you something. And she drew a picture of a little stick figure of her and I. She's got blue, long hair. I've got blue crayons, curly hair. It just meant the world to me, you know? That's awesome. It's just, I mean, to me, that's joy. That was the crux of me saying life is more than trying to get a three X on selling an oil and gas property, which is probably never going to happen. You only read the headlines about those guys, right? Everyone's there's so many management teams out there. 
said, you know, it's not about the money. The money's meant to be there. It'll come. It's really, to me, it's about service, community. Well, I want to encourage you, any kids sports event that I'm at, there's a Flurry's logo because mm. you've sponsored it. Yeah. You guys really have become an important part of the community. And it's awesome to see. The other thing I wanted to say, you talked about your people and how you treat them. Man, in retail and in food service, turnover is incredibly mm-hmm. high. And in the last few years, it's gotten out of control mm-hmm. how bad turnover is. And when I go in, I'm there about once a week, yeah. if not if not more, if we're not traveling. And the faces don't change. Yeah. You've done an excellent job keeping your people. Yeah. And, I, you know, I found my people through that initial phone call to the farm. You really? Know? Yeah. And then the supplier says, well, and it's no different back in, I mean, it's the same tool, same process I learned back in the energy business. We all use the same Halliburton to go frack this well, that frack the competitors well. He was like, hey, Halliburton, how are they doing it? Hey, supplier, you call on these businesses. Who's got some good people out there that probably want to go somewhere else? Huh? I know Jim Bob over at Butcher Shop X. He's probably one of the best. You want to sell number? Hell yeah, I do. Yeah. Guess what? Jim Bob works for me now. True story. I like to share this. When I was still scoping, this is a little ad hoc. Ha- ha- hmm. When I was still scoping, do I want to do this meat market thing? And I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to look up some local meat, some Metroplex meat markets. And I'm going to call and ask the owner and ask them if they would do it. How's it going? And I called one particular meat market in the Metroplex and said, hey, I'm Clayton Flurry. I live in Flower Mound, Texas. I'm thinking about opening a butcher shop here in Flower Mound. I've gone to your website. We kind of look like we're in the same stage of life. You got a beautiful family, by the way. And I've been in your meat shop. I went and looked at it before I made this phone call. I loved it. You get great customer service in there. You think you'd want to have coffee? Maybe you could help me. You know, would you want to talk to me about it? I was not prepared for the response I got. The response I'll just boil it down to was, well, you're not going to be able to do it. I'm planning to open one in Flower Mound myself one day. And you'd just be better off coming and working for me. Well, it was no different than the enterprise guy that said, biggest mistake in your life. I said, okay, all right. <laughs> I'm opening a butcher shop right here. Challenge accepted. Well, you know who's been my number one, who my number one hire was? His best guy. I went and took him. Yeah. Not really out of spite, but it just, hey. <laughs> yeah. Just, it was just funny how it all worked out. Have you had any... No. Follow-up conversations? No. They know. Yeah. Do you ever think about franchising this or expanding it out and you know, crazy. opening other flurries markets? I was getting those questions week one. Where are there other ones of these? Are you going to do more of these? You should do more of these. And, you know, Scott, I don't know. I, I still stand until I can make this one profitable. No. But I do look at other things, right? I am looking at other things along the way that are industry-related call it the A and D experience in me of just in curiosity. I just, I see a product sitting in my store. Who owns it? Who manufactures it? Do they want to sell it? I like it. I believe in it. Could I scale it? Stuff like that. There's a lot of great mom and pops out there that have created cool products that they don't know how or don't want to take it to the next level. And I kind of don't know how, but I sure would like to, because I believe in them and I, I think you could make some money. And so I was telling Katie the other day where I'm at right now with Flurry's Market, and it's not where it's where I personally it's I'm gonna I think this thing, Lord willing, will continue to slowly grow, slowly become a part of the community again, Lord willing, and you know I just and let it do that over time. But I'm a little impatient. I'm gonna try to find other things and just kind of diversify, if you will. Flurry Spice Co., Flurry's Beef Jerky Co., Flurry's Dog Food Co., Flurry whatever it doesn't have to be Flurry's, but sure, you know, just put some more corporate boxes out there. So you, you want to tinker. You yeah, want to, you want to have do. multiple irons yeah. in the fire. Yeah, I do. Because I think one of them, one of them will surely work. So you touched on a few things that I think are consistent with what other entrepreneurs have said. You had a mentor back in Shreveport who, who came alongside you. You talked about surrounding yourself with good people and people that knew more than you did about certain things. And that right there, I think it takes humility so I think there's a lot of people that don't want to admit that they don't have the answers. Yeah. So recognize that you don't have all the answers and that you need other people around you. Treat your people well. And what else would you tell somebody who is thinking about starting a business? Well, this may fall on some, on some deaf ears just because of everyone's different beliefs. 
And last time I checked, we're in a free country and we can believe and have faith or no faith, however we choose. But for those believers, I say, just listen to God, ask God. And I, I stand on that, Scott. I just do. I mean, I don't wear it on my sleeve. I'll never forget calling my father-in-law. I was so knotted up. Do I make this decision? I don't know. I mean, just so just, I can't even think straight, almost dizzy, fearful. And he simply just said, have you prayed about this? And I said, man, that's such a simple solution. And it's not like it gave me the answer. It's not like I said, hey, God, I don't know what to do. And he said, go do this. No, but it did just help me get in the mindset of, well, practice what you preach. I mean, if you believe there's someone that's created and doing all these things and, you know, God put you here and put, you know, put the wife, your wife in your life and, you know, he's, you know, he's truly loving. He's, you know, it may not feel good and you may not make the money you, you want to make, but put your faith there. So that, that comes, that's the first thing. I mean, really, and then the rest of it just kind of falls in place. You may not see it at the time, but man, I can look back at almost every single move, every fork in the road and say, man, that makes sense. Man, sitting in all those different private equity providers' offices and getting told no so many times. I used to think that it was us. It was, it was just we're failures, but no, that was getting experience. That was just learning how to do it better the next time, how to go send over to that bank in Fort Worth and say, yeah, I'm not a meat man, but I want three quarters of a million dollars to go open up a butcher shop. You know, had I not sat in those boardrooms, I would have known how to do that or had the courage to do it. So learn from experiences. Every experience, whether it be good or bad, learn from it. If there was one thing you would go back and do different, if you were starting all over knowing what you know now, what would it be? I don't think there is one because I don't think there's any one thing that I would do different that would change much today other than the, maybe the experienced partner. But I don't know how that really would have turned out because I'm, again, a very curious person. And if, I think I needed to learn the things I've learned through this past year and a half the way I've learned it, the hard way.
right people, man, I think you can do anything. And I tell these young kids that come in the store, and, I, and we have high school guys that, and girls that come in and work for us. And I say, so where, do you do, where are you at in school? Again, it's the joy I have. This is what I love. What do you want to do? It's okay, man. You don't know. You don't know. And, but just know that you can do anything you want to do. Just know in 20 years, you think you're going to be a doctor, but you're going to own a meat shop. I mean, things are going to happen. You're just, so I don't know, Scott. I think that's, if that's an answer of, man, just live your dream. And no, meat, owning a meat market was not my damn dream. I can promise you that. But my joy is people. And I think I found a way to be around people a lot and influence them. Not that I'm trying to influence people, but I do believe that my heart is in the right place to be a light and cast hope in a world that really needs a lot of that right now. Whether you intend to or not, yeah. you influence people yeah. just by being who you are. I mean, not in the general sense. If you're intrinsically good natured, that mm-hmm. influences people. If you're intrinsically bad natured, that influences people. Yeah. So, well, Clayton, thank you for being a guest on In the Thick of It. Heck yeah. Appreciate it, man. I'm proud of what you're doing. It's awesome. You got a beautiful place here. You really do. The whole time I've been talking, I feel like uh, the Saturday Night Live skit, uh, the radio station. Where, uh, <laughs> I don't remember what, what it's, it's called. It's the two ladies. The two ladies. I know, that was, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it's real soft. Yes. Low. Yeah. Monotone. Yeah. Well, keep up the good work. Thanks for having me, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. That was Clayton Flurry, founder of Flurry's Market. To learn more, visit flurriesmarket.com and be sure to follow them on Instagram where you will be entertained and your taste buds will be watered. If you or a founder you know would like to be a guest on In the Thick of It, email us at intro at founderstory.us. 